everyone. If you haven't yet, take your first look at Unreal Engine 5. In the new demo, see two new core technologies. Lumen, a fully dynamic global illumination solution that immediately reacts to scene and light changes, and Nanite virtualized micro polygon geometry, which empowers you to directly import film quality source art comprising hundreds of millions or billions of polygons into Unreal Engine. And it just works. Unreal Engine 5 will be available for preview in early 2021. Watch the full demo with commentary from Epic's Technical Director of Graphics, Brian Karras, and Special Projects Art Director, Jerome Plateau. And we hope you're ready for more big news. Starting today, you can download and use Unreal Engine to build games for free, as you always have, except now royalties are waived on your first $1 million in gross revenue, retroactive to January 1st. Head over to the UnrealEngine.com blog for all the details. We are also thrilled to announce that Epic Online Services are now available to all developers across PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo Switch, PC, and Mac, with support coming soon to iOS and Android. From player identity and friends, crossplay, and achievements, these services empower you to create the best experiences for players with complete freedom of engine, store, and platform integration choice. Want to see what Epic Online Services can do for your game? Head over to the developer portal to download the SDK and get started today. With a near five-star user rating, Lies Beneath is one of the most highly rated VR games designed for the Oculus Quest. The title exemplifies how a AAA quality experience can be tailor-made for Oculus's mobile VR headset. The game was developed by VR veteran studio Drifter, the studio behind Gunheart and Robo Recall Unplugged for the Oculus Quest. Read our interview with Drifter's team to discover their inspirations and how they executed on the game's stylized comic book aesthetic. In a new hands-on presentation, Epic's Shore de Jong breaks down how to enter a beautiful and fully dynamic sky utilizing the robust sky atmosphere system that's now available in Unreal Engine 425, with the added help of Quixel Megascans. Check out his full presentation on our blog, then learn more about Quixel's mission and the future of the sky atmosphere system in a short video from Quixel director Teddy Bergsman and Epic Games' senior rendering programmer Sebastian Hilaire. And thanks to this week's top comma earners doing a lovely job helping others on Answer Hub, Clockwork Ocean, Every Nun, Zia, Detach789, T Sumisaki, Bama Game, Quandini, Evil Cleric, Mr. Tui, and Golden Yuan 3D. Hi. Heading over to our community spotlights, here you see The Invitation, a PBX MMO shooter about the joy of adventure, tough decision making, and harsh consequences. In the invitation, the players and the environment dynamically create quests. Find out more about the invitation on their website. Storyteller, VFX artist, and animator Samuel Walsh began learning Unreal Engine to explore new ways of telling stories. Dogfight was designed to tell a story in the most filmic way possible, not focusing on realistic movement, but on composition. Go behind the scenes of Dogfight and learn more about the project on Walsh's website. After four years of development, Nifty Llama Games revealed Ruth's Journey, a preview of their upcoming interactive story game, The Long Way Home. Set in the same universe, Ruth's Journey follows Ruth as she sets out to photograph the rare golden fish. Watch the full trailer at NiftyLlamaGames.com. Thanks for watching our news and community spotlight. Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Victor Broden and my guest today is our evangelist Christian Allen. Hello, hello! Thanks for coming on the show. 
Um, we are going to cover uh, or demystify soft object references today, but I did wanted to take uh, just a little moment to talk about the announce of Unreal Engine 5. Uh, difficult not to be excited and to mention it, as you saw as part of the news. There is plenty of information available online. If you have not yet checked out the uh, Lumen in the Land of Nanite tech demo that's running on a PlayStation 5, we you definitely should go and do that. Um, but for Indies, I think one of the bigger announcements that we made is that we are now waiving the uh, royalty fee for the first million dollars that your game makes. Um, how do you think this is going to change um, how Indies approach the use of the engine as well as shipping their games? Well, I hope it's going to be a game changer. Um, my focus at Epic is on indies uh, in North America, and so I interact with them a lot. And previously, we waived uh, the first $12,000 a year uh, before we started uh, uh, calculating royalties. And now with this move from that you know, $12,000 a year to a million dollars um, for the entire uh, life cycle of the product, um, it, ideally, what it's going to do is just allow indies to do what we want them to do is really focus on the game. Uh, so they're not worried about royalties and, and and calculating that in the first few months as projects come out. They can just really focus on their product and their customers uh, and the quality level. Um, and then once they start generating revenue, uh, significant revenue for themselves, uh, then we can we can talk about collecting royalties. So I think it really just reinforces our company wide goals across Epic, both for Unreal Engine and our other services to try to get this uh, content and these tools distributed as broadly as possible and try to lower as many barriers as we can uh, to allow um, you know, new content and uh, that content is king. So that's what we want to focus on. Yeah, empower everyone, right? To be able to be as creative as possible and then sort of worry about the financial details later. Yeah, exactly. If you get there, yeah. Exactly. And, um, you know, again, um, just taking that off the table with developers, you know, we started, we, we've gone through a lot of permutations of, of royalty and fee structures uh, over the years. And we've just found that just allowing developers to focus on development first, not worry about having different tiers of, um, you know, uh, subscriptions and things like that when it comes to the technology mm -hmm. um you know if if your game is hugely successful um then awesome uh that's yeah. that's that's where we want you to be um because you know we are royalty based that allows us to share in the success and it really the the thing i like about it as evangelist is it really helps to align our goals you know i while i'm helping a developer i don't have to worry about well, let me check and see if they're a silver member or a gold member or um, let, let me, uh, oh, you just launched your game a month ago. Let me make sure and check it that you've, you know, paid royalties until I can help you. It just aligns everybody together. Um, so again, focusing on high quality content, uh, good good content and gameplay for the consumer um, because that's what's going to help make the, the product successful. And so it aligns our business goals with our, uh, with all our other goals too. Also want to make sure if you haven't noticed yet or in case you just joined and you missed the intro, uh, we just did a huge uh, public release of Epic Online Services, which will allow you to, and it's it's just to, to mention that it is completely free and um, which is just huge. It's like a whole, whole back end of online services that you're now able to use for your game. Um, and that's going to empower, you know, uh, a, a lot more developers to sort of implement what previously could have been a rather... Uh, expensive or rather, you know, difficult thing. Um, any, any comments on EOS? Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing about EOS, uh, Epic Online Services, is that, um, one, it is free, um, which, which is kind of a running theme. Um, but the big thing about it is it's engine agnostic. So obviously, we want Unreal, we want Unreal Engine developers to check it out. Um, but regardless what kind of core technology uh, you're using, you should look into it. I mean, one of the big focuses on it is to you know break down the walls in the gardens to open it up um, to things like crossplay. Obviously, crossplay uh, we feel is hugely important, uh, as you've seen with the development of Fortnite, uh, to allow um, developers to uh, have that kind of uh, access to. Um, online services that uh, aren't specific to the platform that they're launching on, aren't specific to a certain storefront, uh, whether it be, you know, Epic Game Store or other stores, um, uh, 
again, give that power to the developers. So, you know, it is a standalone SDK, uh, you know, compatible with all, with with major engines. Um, so regardless of whether you're using Unreal, uh, I, I encourage you to go check it out. And, and we're going to be continuing uh, to launch additional services with that, um, additional support. There'll be, uh, you know, roadmaps published uh, of, of those as they come online as well. Yeah, there's a lot more to come. This is sort of just the initial, initial announcement. And as we work our way uh, towards release, there will be uh, a lot more to come. And on that topic, I'd like to mention that tomorrow, if you have more technical details regarding the technology that we announced yesterday, uh, there will be tech talks announced uh, or released on YouTube, two of them specifically. And so make sure you tune into our social media channels and you can see when, um, when they are live. Um, moving on, we are also, we will of course be covering UV5 on the live streams in the future. Uh, and so stay tuned for that as well. Uh, moving on, I think it's time to get on to, to today's topic. Yes, exciting times. The exciting stuff that everybody wants to talk about besides Unreal 5 and Unreal. Memory <laughs> management. <laughs> Memory management. Hard object loading and soft object references. Well, it's a good topic to cover, right? Because it's something that affects pretty much every single game and something that you should always keep in mind from the moment you start. And the more practice you get, uh, sort of do this workflow, the easier it's going to get for you to spend less time in the end refactoring and, and sort of looking at some of the problems that you have, right? Yes, definitely. And it's something that um, that has come up a lot. You know, as an evangelist, I travel around to our various Unreal Engine meetups that are community run groups uh, all around North America um, and obviously our other evangelists around the world. And it when I'm doing my presentations of the various demos uh, that I've done, I've, I've referenced this every once in a while. And every time I, I, I bring it up, a lot of hands shoot in the air and a lot of people start asking questions um, because uh, it's not a super complicated concept. Um, but I think there's just a lot of misconceptions um, and, and, you know, it's not necessarily readily apparent, uh, mm -hmm. especially when you're just getting started and um, you're kind of using a lot of the default settings and just rolling forward. Um, and generally it doesn't become an issue or a problem until one, you get very far along in development and you've got a lot of content or you're trying to optimize for a platform such as mobile or low end PC, uh, where users might have as much, not as much memory available. Um, memory management is, you know, a, a, can be a, a relatively complicated uh, aspect, but as a game designer, uh, which is my specialty, game, game design and, and blueprint scripting, uh, there are a lot of things um, in uh, kind of the planning phase and as you're setting up your blueprints and structuring your objects, um, and so I've got some just kind of simple uh, tips and tricks to, to get started with that today. Awesome. Well, let's get started. Cool, cool. So um, I'll, I'll kind of just just jump uh, talking a little bit before I get into the demonstration. I actually mm -hmm. made a, a, a video uh, version of what I'm showing today uh, that I released a couple weeks ago. And, and the popularity and the response to it is really, I think, what, uh, what uh, got you to invite me here today. So sure th was. that's that's really good. Um, the general idea is that when you think about um, memory management and object loading, uh, object oriented design, um, you're thinking about controlling when and where you, you uh, are loading objects uh, into memory. Um, and really in Blueprint specifically, where that comes down to is hard objects, references and soft object references. And the, the, the key concept to get your head around that is essentially a hard object reference is you're, you're essentially attaching the object to your blueprint. So when you have a hard object reference that, that, that you object, uh, the, that uh, actor or whatever it may be, um, is gonna be attached to the blueprint and then it's gonna be loaded into memory whenever the blueprint is accessed, whenever the blueprint is loaded. Um, and that's uh, kind of a, a hierarchical uh, cascading uh, effect. So if you have a, ob a hard object reference in a blueprint, you open that, uh, that blueprint, it's gonna open the blueprint of that hard object reference. If that uh, object also has additional references, those are gonna be loaded and so on and so on and so on. So you can see the, the kind of cascading effect. A soft object reference is basically, I, I like to think about it as, as the web. Um, a soft object reference is essentially a, a web link 
to the the object uh, on the user's hard drive or on your hard drive. Mm -hmm. And so it's storing the location of that object, and then you're going to control um, when it is actually loaded into memory. Um, so that's kind of the way to think about it. When it's when it's a soft object reference, it's just sitting there on your hard drive until you kind of reach out and 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 uh, tell the game uh, or the engine to actually load it up. Um, so the demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. So the demonstration I've got here is a very simple project uh, that I built. This is just One a, a second, Christian. I have okay. a little delay in OBS here. Just went completely black trying to figure out what happened there. It's live, baby. It is live. All right, we're good. OK, cool. Uh, so what I have here is just a very simple uh, project that's set up. Um, we've got a scene uh, just with some static, uh, some various different mesh objects in the background. Um, but the key for this demonstrator is this blueprint object that I have uh, represented by the Shinbi uh, skeletal mesh, um, obviously available for free on our marketplace. Um, and so I've got a very basic blueprint that contains uh, uh, two references to skeletal meshes. One is the one that you see here, the, the default uh, skeletal mesh um, of Shinbi. And another is a variant uh, of her skeletal mesh with a different material set. Um, and what I like to do to demonstrate this is this is a fresh version of the, uh, of the editor that I've opened. Um, and I'm going to use a console command to show my object list. Um, this is a console command is object list class. Uh, and in, in this example, I'm just uh, using skeletal mesh. Uh, object list class basically displays all of that type of class that you have loaded into memory or open in this scene uh, at any one time. So you can see uh, if I expand this upward um, down at the bottom here, um, you can see that basically it's showing that I have one skeletal mesh uh, in memory, um, and that's the shinbi.shinbi uh, object. Um, it shows you know memory usage, things like that. Obviously, in a larger project, this, this, this list is going to be much bigger, uh, but for this example, I just have the one. Um, now, something to consider when you're looking at this is that this is going to display anything that the editor currently has loaded into memory. Um, so if I go and say, go into my content directory and start opening up a bunch of different skeletal meshes out of the content directory, the editor is going to load those into memory. And if I then run that console command, it's going to show all of those objects. Um, so generally when you want to test this, you either want to be in a fresh, uh, version of the editor that you've just opened up that you're not opening up a various bunch of things, uh, or you want to run these kind of tests in, um, in a, a cooked build. Uh, there are uh, various different console commands uh, that you can use to display, you know, uh, memory jumps. Uh, you, can, you can do dumps full of text and things like that. Uh, there's lots of information uh, about that online. So I'll jump over um, to the actual blueprint here and talk about a little bit about uh, what I've got going on. So uh, when I say hard object reference and soft object reference, essentially in, in your variable, in your components. So here's the components that I have. Basically, again, super simple. Uh, up on the upper left, it's basically just this skeletal mesh. Uh, it's a skeletal mesh component. And on the right, you can see that it's uh, set to the one that's being displayed. Um, so be, that is, uh, by default, that that component uh, and that reference is a, is a hard reference. Um, that means every time this blueprint is accessed, um, that's going to be loaded into memory. Obviously, it needs to be loaded into memory because it's displaying it uh, here and it's going to be displaying it in the game. Um, and then in our components, we've got variables. Um, and if I go down um, over here, we've, I've got another uh, variable uh, reference to a different uh, skeletal mesh. Uh, this is the Shinbi Dynasty skeletal mesh. The difference here between these two is that one is a hard object reference and one is a soft object reference. Um, and if you see, if you mouse over it, um, I'm showing that it's a skeletal mesh soft object reference. Um, and the way that you control that, the basic way you control it is when you create a variable, I'll create a new one here and I'll just call it dummy 
variable. And I'm just going to move my zoom display, which is in the way. Okay. And I go over to variable type in the upper right. Move that a little bit more. And I'll bring up skeletal mesh. And so sometimes it gets a little hard to see because the pop ups are jumping up and giving me the information. Um, but we've got the different reference here. So we've got object reference, class reference, soft object reference, and soft class reference. By default, everything's going to be an object reference. Again, that's a hard reference. Um, generally, it just says object reference. That's defaulting to being a hard reference. Uh, same with the class reference. That's going to be a hard reference. It's going to load that class into memory. Now, these selections down here are the soft object references. So basically, when you create a variable, the basic easy way to do this is just to click onto soft object reference. Um, when I compile it, it is now it's a soft object reference. Um, so you interact in this phase with everything almost exactly the same. You, you, you can go through your content browser. Uh, you can choose various different you know, uh, uh, selections however you want to do it. Um, and uh, so, so that's how you do the basic setup. Um, now, because soft object references are essentially just web links uh, to materials, there is a little bit of a difference in how you access them. Um, the first thing that you're going to want to think about is how they're actually loaded into memory. Um, and let me just move my display again. Um, so what I've got here is a very simple, uh, in the event graph, a very uh, simple blueprint that's essentially um, loading the, uh, the, the reference that I, I created earlier, the soft object reference to that other skeletal mesh, um, pulling some information out of it, i.e. The, the string, the name, um, casting it, and then setting it as a hard variable so that I can continue to interact with it uh, beyond that point. Um, so async load asset, um, asynchronous loading uh, nodes, uh, this works both for uh, loading an individual asset or the one for an entire class is, I believe, called async load class, um, is essentially your way through blueprints of loading, uh, loading the, the, the class up. Um, and there's a few key terms. One, asynchronous. Asynchronous means that um, it uh, loads the object asynchronously while the rest of the game simulation continues to run. Uh, so when you activate an async load asset, um, it's not going to pause everything and wait for you. It's just going to start loading it. And then when it's done, it'll be available. So you want to keep that in mind, um, either having delays or uh, you can use just the nodes uh, right off of this. Um, uh, the completed node will only fire once the object's actually loaded into memory. Um, sometimes if you want to string right off that, that's, that's the best way to do it. Uh, or if you have a bunch of assets that you want to load uh, to kind of stage things out, uh, you can kind of do your time control through that. Um, it's kind of up to you. Something that's good to mention is that that <laughs> timer indicates that that blueprint function is an asynchronous function and that is uh, across the board out of if you see that timer it means that the function is asynchronous and that's a great point yeah you'll see it uh that i, I have these delays that i just put in um these delays aren't necessary uh to the actual um the, the actual function of this they're just so that when i actually show the demonstration here in a minute uh there's enough time for your brain to actually process what's happening because it'll run too fast yeah um and you'll see they have that same pop-up just to let you know that that's running asynchronously so that's a great point um, so the next thing is that uh, to think about uh, or to kind of get your brain wrapped around is that um, essentially because this is just a, a, a link uh, to a location of an object, the engine and the blueprint don't actually uh, know uh, the data that's contained in it. They don't, it, it, it doesn't have all the information. That's one of the reasons why when you make a default, a hard object reference, the object is by default loaded into memory is because we're the, the the engine is assuming that when you're placing a, a hard variable into your blueprint, that you're going to be referencing that. You're going to be using it for something, either loading into memory and activating it, or you're going to want to be pulling data out of it. So it needs to have all that information loaded. Um, so the first thing that we need to do, if we want to interact with it in this case, once it's loaded into memory, is actually cast to it as the class that it is. And so what that's doing um, is telling the engine, hey, this link to this object 
is a skeletal mesh actor. And so um, uh, we're going to cast to it as a skeletal mesh actor. And then that allows you uh, to reference the various different things, whether it be materials, you know, variables that you have in public variables that you want to interact with. Um, so once this is, is loaded into memory, um, I'm casting to it as a skeletal mesh. Uh, I have another delay built in. Again, that's just for viewing uh, after the print, print string is, is delayed. And then um, I uh, set the actual skeletal mesh component uh, to that new uh, skeletal mesh that I have loaded into memory. Um, after that, I am actually setting it to a hard variable. So I have a, an empty variable that I've created here. You can see it's a nothing's referenced in here. Uh, and now I'm actually uh, setting it to that variable. So after this is done, uh, if I want to uh, reference that uh, variable like I normally would, I can just go out and start, you know, you know, uh, referencing it and, and interacting with it. Uh, so once you do that, then later on in your uh, in your blueprints, you can just treat them uh, treat them however you would a normal uh, variable. You don't actually have to worry about it at that point. Um, another thing I get asked uh, usually about this point in the um, in the presentation is uh, is about unloading the assets. Well, here's how you know I've showed you how to manually load the assets into memory. What about unloading them? Um, there's not a blueprint load to uh, a blueprint node to manually unload the objects. Uh, once they're loaded into memory, they're going to be treated like any other uh, U object. So uh, once the actor is destroyed and it's no longer referenced by anything else, then your garbage collection will come and, and remove it out of memory when that's appropriate. Um, so once it's loaded into memory, again, you can kind of treat it like any other uh, any other U object uh, when it comes to memory management and garbage uh, garbage collection. We did have some questions about sort of garbage collection and when it gets uh, when it gets collected. Could you go into detail a little bit about when? How would that go about? When when would that garbage garbage collection come in and actually nuke nuke that from memory? Um, well, the memory manager is going to control that. Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of specific details. Um, you can force garbage collection. That is uh, that is a, a blueprint node. So if you know, for example, uh, that you're going to be uh, you know, doing something very specific where you, maybe you want to stay in the same level, but you, you've had a bunch of objects uh, that have just been destroyed uh, and you want to have a new set of objects, you can force garbage collection. Generally, when you open up a new level, uh, you know, that's obviously a point where garbage collection is automatically going to happen. Um, and also as the memory manager uh, that runs in the background is, is keeping an eye on the memory and, you uh, um, uh, recognizing that things uh, that, that garbage collection can be run, uh, it's, it's going to be handling that. Um, obviously, if you're getting into C++, there's a lot finer control on, uh, on garbage collection. Uh, and there's a lot of documentation on, uh, on that, that side of things uh, um, on, on, uh, on our, in our documentation. Um, so, yes, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think to add, to add to that, I believe if you were to say destroy this blueprint, that was actually the blueprint that loaded the soft object reference and then you stored it, you know, in the empty scale mesh variable. If you were to destroy this blueprint, that would uh, eventually get garbage collected as well, right? And if you were to spawn that again, you would have to asynchronously load the, uh, uh, the asset from the soft object reference again, right? Correct, correct. Although that does touch on uh, one thing that I should talk about, and that's the, the hierarchical nature of, um, of blueprints. Um, and uh, let, me, let me go ahead and show the demonstration, and then I yeah. can get into uh, like, like the class parts of things and the hierarchical part. So um, basically, I, I kind of walk through the blueprint. It's nice and simple. Essentially, on begin play, uh, you're going to see it waits a few seconds. Um, uh, once the asset is actually loaded, it's going to pop up a string uh, in the upper left uh, and, and say, hey, this has been loaded into memory. And then there's going to be another delay, and then you'll see the actual character swap over. So you'll see that uh, I'm going to run this uh, console command one more time. If I can click on the right button. So there's my skeletal, uh, the, the list of the skeletal meshes. Again, even though you saw me uh, interacting with those variables, placing the variable, creating new ones, um, even though I created that new uh, skeletal mesh variable as a soft object reference, it's still not loaded into memory. 
Um, so that's, uh, you can see it's still right there. Now, when I hit play, uh, you'll, you're going to see uh, essentially what I described, and then we'll come back and see what's loaded into memory after that. It's, it's going to be a pretty exciting surprise. <laughs> So here we have the demonstration on the upper left. You're going to see a text pop up. There she is. She's loaded into memory. And then a few seconds later, she switches over to the Dynasty uh, uh, model. Um, oops. So I'll run that one more time. You get to see it again. Yeah, you can see it again. There it is loaded into memory. And now it's popped up. You notice the second time it, it, it went a lot faster because it was already loaded into memory. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the only thing slowing that down was that actual delay. That's why I had to put it in because otherwise it just happens like that. Um, so now when I run that object uh, console command, you'll see now, boom, now there's two. Um, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, so we have the uh, the Shinbi uh, and uh, Dynasty. So now again, uh, the editor by default pretty much keeps most things loaded in the memory that it's ever had open because it, that's just, it assumes that you're gonna be working with that again. Um, so again, something to consider. If I, if I just keep adding objects and keep opening objects, this list is just gonna grow and grow and grow okay. while I'm in, it, in this editor session. Um, so the, again, the easiest way when you're working, doing tests like this would just be close the editor, reopen a fresh setting and then, and then kind of start from there. Um, so, uh, let's go back to the blueprint while I'm talking about, uh, the hierarchical stuff. So, um, again, the, where this really comes into play, um, is both your, uh, the amount of memory that you're taking up, um, uh, with various objects and where people, where you start to get into trouble is, um, related to what you were talking about earlier about destroying the destroying the this specific actor this blueprint um, and then it not being loaded into memory the thing that you have to remember is in object oriented design everything is hierarchical so if you create a base class of uh, an actor with just a default skeletal mesh uh, in it um, that then has say 10 materials and a bunch of textures and a bunch of various different things um, uh, and that's say a dummy uh, that you're never going to use. And then you start creating child classes of, uh, that, that actor. Uh, so you start creating children and you start setting them to different skeletal meshes, which have their own set of materials, their own set of textures, things like that. Every time you load one of those children, that parent's going to be loaded as well. Um, because the child inherits things from that parent, it needs to have that in memory. Uh, so if you put a bunch of variable, a bunch of content into that parent and then start loading multiple different children that just gets it's bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more objects. And so even if you destroy the children, the, the, the parent might necessarily not uh, be referenced. The other thing that people forget a lot is when it comes to things like casting. So I mentioned casting uh, earlier that you need to cast the soft object reference, but a lot of people don't understand that when you cast to an object, you cast to a blueprint, it also gets loaded into memory. Um, it, it, but just because you're casting to it from one blueprint, uh, it's not only loading that very specific thing, it's loading the entire blueprint into memory because it needs, again, needs to have all that information uh, to pull out whatever you're trying to reference. So again, thinking about things hierarchically, if I, you know, have that parent class, then I have all those children classes, and then, you know, that goes from there, and I cast to those, that whole chain is going to be loaded into memory. And where this comes into play when it comes to memory management is not just the total amount of memory you're using, which can affect things like load time. So, um, you know, if in your, say, your scene, uh, you've got a bunch of blueprints that cast other blueprints that have a bunch of references themselves, um, and you wonder why your load times take a really long time, it's because the, it's, the game's not actually doing that until you open the scene, until you open the level. So if you open the level, it has a bunch of blueprints that are referencing a bunch of other blueprints, all that stuff has to be loaded in memory. So that's increasing your load time. Um, so you can, of course, then you can use soft object references in and uh, stage that loading ahead of time um, to, to you know, smooth that out or just reduce all those references so that you're not having that giant load time. The other thing when it comes to performance is the memory manager is keeping track of those objects. It's, uh, it's clumping them together into different chunks of memory. Um, and if, especially if you have a lot of little 
I, I'd say like small objects, um, you know, in the course of like thousands of, of various different uh, small objects, those are constantly being kind of arranged and clumped together to be the most efficient uh, use of your memory. Um, but that takes, that takes uh, you know, uh, performance in CPU to do that. Um, that generally doesn't take, you know, doesn't hurt you too bad. Um, but again, if, if you start getting to, into thousands and thousands of these objects, uh, being constantly uh, managed uh, in the background that can affect performance. Um, so let's see, um, kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, so uh, so one of the ways to uh, kind of reduce uh, this overhead is when you're setting up uh, uh, kind of your, your dummy objects, you can, uh, reference, uh, you know, lower impact objects. Uh, you know, one of the things that I do is when I'm setting up a lot of my classes, I'll use the mannequin, um, the Unreal mannequin for most of my skeletal mesh references as just the default. Um, and if you're always using that one thing as a default and then you just budget in that, okay, I'm gonna use the mannequin or whatever default character you may have. Um, if you're always using those references, then especially something that's just always going to be loaded in memory anyway, um, then you can kind of reduce your overhead just right there. And then you can use your soft object references to then load up the very specific uh, information that you want to have. Uh, for example, in Parachess, uh, which is the, the, the game demo that actually brought me to this, I have the entire set of Paragon characters uh, from the marketplace available in that game. Um, and when I started out, it's, it's a chess game. So there's only, uh, I think, uh, 14 possible characters on screen at once. Um, and uh, I had all that set up and uh, just using hard object references. And that was totally fine that, you know, with the scope of the game that I was making, mm -hmm. um, all the characters were loaded up in front because it's chess, you, you don't get more characters as game goes on, you get less characters. So, you know, in, in performance just improved the longer you played. Um, but as soon as I went in and said, oh, okay, well, I'm going to have all of the uh, Paragon characters as well as all of their variants, that's upwards of 70 AAA uh, level characters uh, and, and uh, loaded into memory at any one time. And so if I, in my base blueprints, had all of those characters and all of their, their variants uh, listed as hard object, as hard references, default, uh, default references, every single one of those is going to be loaded into memory when I open that up. Now, eventually, if those aren't ever, uh, if I destroyed that actor and it wasn't used, then garbage collection would, would clean that up. But if I'm not actually using those, I don't want all 70 of those characters loaded into memory just to choose 14 of them to actually use for the game. That's that's just super inefficient for the player to sit to wait for all those to be loaded up, and then I might right. run into memory management issues. Uh, so instead of that, what I did is just have all the characters listed as soft object references, uh, and then um, as the game loads and the, the player actually chooses the set that they're going to have, um, uh, that's when I actually asynchronous load them uh, and continue on from there. And of course, with with clever management, you know, you could maybe always load the default that, that, that they're going to have. And then as the player is opening up widgets and doing different things, uh, you could start to asynchronously load the things that you think the player might, you know, might possibly uh, going to be, be choosing. So you can just make smart decisions around there. And we did do a, a stream, stream on Parachess earlier last year. Yes, yes, um, and uh, I'm still working on that, uh, getting getting through the chess rules. Um, but uh, I did a lot of work. Uh, a, a lot of the actual delay in in uh, in, in releasing Parachess has been from going back. I didn't do it initially. I just kind of ran with it, and until I started getting into you know 70 plus characters um, at high resolution, that's when I started realizing, especially when I said. Oh, I'm going to make this on go on, on on the switch or on mobile. It's like, oh, I really need to start thinking about memory management, and that's where you know thinking about this ahead of time and starting to plan out uh, how you're or organizing your content in smart and efficient ways really comes into into play. Um, the earlier you do it, um, even if even if it you know you don't think that. Um, uh, you know, you're you're going to have a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of these objects. You know, in a year or two, um, it's a lot easier to set it up uh, smart and efficiently in the beginning than it is when you're in beta testing and you have to go back and realize that 
hey, when I first set up the system for, you know, weapon pickups, uh, I was only going to have 12 different weapons, but we decided to add weapon skins and the weapon skins now attached, right? So now you had one weapon with one skin. Now you have 10 skins per weapon. And now instead of 10, you know, weapon skeletal meshes being loaded, you have a hundred and then you add another variant. Now you have a thousand and now you have 10,000. Um, and so, you know, thinking of that ahead of time and structuring, it doesn't take a lot of time in the beginning when you're setting things up, but when you haven't touched a blueprint in six months and you're having to go back and go, okay, now I need to restructure everything to do asynchronous loading and think about how these are going to, uh, how these are going to affect the player. Um, it can, it can become a real hurdle. Um, so, you know, setting up the, the object oriented hierarchy, um, separating blueprints, um, looking into things like blueprint interfaces. A lot of people uh, choose to use blueprint interfaces for this type of management. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, a blueprint interface is, is something that just contains variables that's sitting alongside your uh, blueprint. Um, some people use other methods. Uh, I personally like um, uh, the soft object references because I can basically treat them uh, just like any other variable within my blueprint. I can organize them within my blueprint. I can have everything uh, there on the the, blue, the variable viewer. I can organize them uh, that way. Um, so thinking about memory, memory management, um, you know, ahead of time, it was interesting. I was reading an article by a developer that was doing uh, VR development and, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, working on desktop, everything was fine until they got, you know, to actual testing with the actual hardware and they were having like seven minute load times. And when they, uh, they said, this doesn't make sense. Like the levels are taking seven minutes to load. Um, but the levels aren't that heavy what what's going on and then they opened up a blank empty space started doing memory dumps and and here they have a thousand twelve hundred objects loaded in an empty scene and they're like what's going on and then they start digging in um and it's like oh it was the hard object reference they've got class that that, that cast to other classes they've got references um to uh pawns that that then have uh, or, or characters that have things like pickups that are referenced. And then, uh, you know, if you think about an RPG where, you, you know, it, it's really easy, like in a, in a player character uh, file to say like, well, I'm just going to have the five classes of weapons inside the character. And then when the, you know, when the player walks over a weapon pickup, it, it's already there and I can reference it and it's great. But again, you start expanding that in, a, in an RPG and now you've got, you know, thousands of combinations with, with uh, dozens of different materials uh, for each object, and it just it exponentially explodes. Also, gets difficult to manage at that point. And if you're already prepared for that, then you'll have a little bit of an easier time getting there. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned blueprint interfaces because they're definitely a, a good way. Because they're they're agnostic; they don't care what kind of um, object that you're trying to call this function on. They just care if the interface has been implemented or not. And even if it hasn't been implemented, you won't get an error because it's it's just a call that you're doing. And if it's not there, it will be perfectly fine. But that's also something you do need to think of that you it won't tell you if you're uh, if you haven't implemented it. So definitely need to think about it. Something else that I, I tend to do, we talked a little bit about this earlier, is that if it's possible for you, if you're only looking to sort of access a, um, a, a piece of data inside uh, the blueprint that you're talking to that exists in, you know, the base level of actor, you don't need to um, declare that variable as the specific class of object that you're trying to talk to um, to save a little bit of memory, right? Because if you just instead, oh, say you need to this, you need a reference to that actor to sort of destroy it later or something. That destroy function already exists as the base class actor, and so therefore you don't need. And it's it's easy to do, right? Because you drag out like from the cast or something, and um, and you, uh, you promote a variable, and, and if it's aware of which class that is, and it was just not a cast to an actor or something uh, low level, then it will actually create a piece uh, or declare a variable that is now that specific class, and so therefore it will be loaded once the, the initial actor is loaded. Um, and so keeping those things in mind um, can help you sort of keep the cost down. And once they become, um, once you get used to it, you won't think about it anymore, and it's just part of your s sort of workflow. Yeah, and, and I, I think that brings up another point, um, uh, and, and that's a great one. Is you know, uh, you know, um, it, yeah. By by saying uh, I need to uh, you know cast to this actor class that you know is five levels down from a base actor, it, it has to step through each one of those children 
um, or each one of those references, load ever, all that stuff into memory um, just to do, you know, like a simple destroy function. Uh -huh. um, and so if you're casting to it, you know, as especially if you built a lot of hierarchy in um, with a lot of different references. Um, but the other thing is, uh, if I if I pop back over, do I'm going to do a share screen again. And um, a lot of people don't they, they don't really get the idea that again, any reference uh, in the blueprint where you're telling the blueprint, you need to know this information, it's going to be loaded into memory. So it doesn't matter. Oh, let me stop my simulation. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a, a actual variable uh, over here on your, on your variable list or your components, right? It, it, it matters that it's referenced. So if I do, um, you know, spawn actor from class, right? And then I do a drop down of the actor class, and, and pick one here, uh, let's say, I don't know, just, uh, uh, yeah, here's a default one that I, I, I uh, uh, created. Um, if this is sitting in your blueprint, that class is going to be loaded into memory, right? It doesn't matter whether it's been spawned yet or, or what, that's, that's loaded into memory now. Um, uh, because it, the, the editor is assuming that if, if you've got this object in, when you spawn it, you want it to spawn instantly. So in order for it to be spawned, it's already got to be loaded in memory. Uh, otherwise, you would, uh, you would uh, have to wait for it to load for it to actually spawn. Um, so a way around this, uh, or, or the way to not have this loaded in memory, and that's fine if 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 you know if, if that's what you want to do. Um, but this this class this 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 um, reference is going to be loaded in memory. So if I wanted to not do that, um, then what I could do is come back over here, create a new var, uh, new dummy var, and then if I go into uh, the variable type, change that over. I just use skeletal meshes just because I'm using here to soft class reference. And now when I place that in and link that up, oops. Oh, uh, let's see, because I'm just doing an actor. Let's just change that back to actor. Yeah, the data types are context sensitive. <clears throat> yeah. Which is really yeah, nice when you start out, but can sometimes uh, confuse you when you haven't done it right. Yeah, but it it uh, it stops you from doing things that are wrong, which Correct. is great. Actor, so I'll do that drop down, soft class reference, change the variable type. So uh, it's going to con convert the soft object to a class. Now, what I would want to do is actually um, do again do async uh, load uh, class. Um, and then I could uh, run off of that. So the key is that uh, anytime you, you've got a reference, whether it's a placed variable over here um, or just basically any kind of reference, I'm casting to it, um, casting as a class. Again, if I uh, cast, like you mentioned, if I cast as an actor, um, or if I cast as a skeletal mesh, I, I go down that hierarchy, um, that, that information and all those references uh, ahead of that are going to be loaded into memory. That's great. Are you ready for a couple of questions? See if we can, uh, see if we can tackle them. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I'm sure I will be, uh, uh, dumbfounded on a couple, but I will take as, uh, as far as I can. Well, it's, it is a rather complex, um, subject if you, you know, go all the way down to the low level of what's actually happening. Right. Um, and so, so it can be tricky. Um, let's see, we, um, one of the main questions I'll repeat a few times is sort of, uh, you might have tackled this, but maybe we, let, we can just dive into it. What happens when you try loading a soft reference asset that's already loaded? Um, that's a great question. Uh, essentially, the, uh, the async is just going to immediately complete. Okay. Um, so actually, uh, you saw it on that second time I ran through a round. I didn't get any errors or anything. It just said loading complete um, because it's already loaded in the memory. Uh, so, you know, except for a wasted call, which is super minimal, mm -hmm. um, essentially, you're not going to get any error messages or anything like that. The completed is just going to fire off 
uh, immediately. And so even if you say for some reason you had two different functions, uh, they both individually need to reference something that you have a soft object reference to. Um, you are not sure which of the functions will be called first, so they both need to implement the asynchronous uh, loading uh, function. If one of them has already executed and the other one gets called later, even if you have two separate paths of that asynchronous loading, it will know that it's already loaded and just immediately execute, yes? I believe so, yes. Um, okay. You should def definitely double test it, uh, double check it uh, in your project. Um, but, but yeah, I believe that's the functionality uh, that I've seen. Um, and uh, the other thing to, to keep in mind uh, just on that note is uh, that that completed node is the important part because the default execution pin is going to fire as soon as that block goes by. It's, it's going to assume that you want to just keep going. Um, and so, like, for example, if you run not off the completed, just on the default pin, and then immediately try to cast to it, and it's not loaded yet, your cast is going to fail because it's not loaded into memory. Uh, so if you're trying to do a race condition, you know, you could also have logic to, you know, double check that your cast has failed and then continue to cast. Um, but you're going to need to have that logic in. Just like anytime you're dealing with a delay, anything that's asynchronous, the time management is, is really on, on your shoulders. See, we did have a, a question. If you could give a quick example of where this delay load technique would be useful. And I think you specified that it was uh, specifically just for the, the purpose of the presentation of us being able to see the difference of the hard one being loaded and then the soft one actually uh, asynchronous loading in and replacing it. Yeah, correct. In this example, I just put the delays in um, uh, to have some time to process because my computer's too fast and it would be instantaneous. Where you you would possibly want to use time delays in um, is, uh, I, I guess, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to have a set of assets that you loaded up, started loading first to make sure they're kind of first in the queue. And then you wanted to put it a delay in where before you started loading other assets, um, that that might be a time frame. Um, but uh, the, one of the, the good reasons for it uh, uh, or, or thing to think about it is when you're debugging stuff and you, and you're, you want to put those delays in so that your brain can, when you're debugging, you can put in text pop-ups. Because if you just like run text strings off of everything telling you, uh, you know, when things are, and then don't put delays in, you're just going to get a massive, you know, text dump. Um, so I use delays a lot like that for, um, for debugging, um, uh, into personal things. Um, so yeah. Um, someone's wondering if there, if you can share any best practices to handle race conditions with asynchronous loading to make sure everything is loaded on clients before spawning players. Um, that's uh, essentially you can use um, uh, logic in your blueprint interfaces to put in stage gates. Um, so, for example, if I had 10 different objects uh, that I wanted to make sure uh, it was going into um, loaded into memory before I started doing anything else, um, I could put uh, essentially build a, a set of Boolean logic and, you know, um, uh, have a set of, of variables, whether it be, you know, in increments uh, or, uh, you know, or Booleans uh, that check to see uh, essentially, hey, you know, start the asynchronous loaded when, you know, number one is complete, you know, uh, set to true or inc uh, or uh, increment the, the an integer uh, variable. And then when all 10 are true, then continue on. Uh, so just, just basic logic um, uh, that, you, that, that you would use uh, in, uh, in any other case. Um, someone's wondering, when would we use an actor soft reference versus an actor class soft reference? Um, essentially, when you want to uh, reference a, a very specific uh, thing. Um, so, you know, the class is going to load up, uh, is also going to load up um, its children. Um, an actor is going to load up the, the, the child and the parent. Um, so the class is, is going to load the entire thing, uh, and the actor is just going to load the, the specific object that you need. I tend to um, generally, when I'm setting up the variables, I tend to work in um, uh, references to the specific actors rather than, than the class. Uh, that's just how my brain works. It also depends a little bit what kind of 
logic you're trying to execute there and what type of data uh, those functions expect. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, the, the system is set up uh, to be mal malleable and, uh, and versatile, depending on, on how, you're, how you're trying to set up your project. So th there can be a lot of personalization uh, based on, on what you're trying to do in specific cases. Uh, this question might be a little tricky, but let's see. Um, would you recommend digging into the asset registry and try and combine that with soft object references for asset streaming? Can you even do that? Um, well, if uh, yes, I would I would encourage uh, people to look into the asset registry. Uh, it's good information to have. As far as combining them, um, it's so dependent on what you're what exactly you're trying to do. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of it, it, one of the nice things about, um, uh, you know, the blueprint system and object oriented design in, in general is that it, um, you can come at things different ways. You know, again, you know, you can have this exact same effect using soft object references in your blueprint or creating a blueprint interface that only contains those uh, those uh, references that you need to have, um, and then attach that to the to the uh, appropriate blueprints that you want to reference. Um, and asset registries are another way to do um, uh, management that way. Um, so I I don't have a a perfect like yes in this specific case you should you should definitely do that. Um, but the more knowledge you have about the system in general, uh, the better equipped that you're going to have to be able to uh, organize things again with the logic that you want to use to uh, build out your project. I think that applies to, to a lot of things. Having a little bit of a sort of com computer science understanding of what you're actually doing has has helped me a lot, and that's something that came after I was even making things. Um, it just makes you understand like why why am I why am I going through this convoluted way of getting it to work like this? Why is this best practice? It's like oh you know it's zeros and ones on a on a CPU that actually <laughs> needs to execute all of this, and here are the reasons why it needs to do what it needs to do, which then leads us to when we when we do the abstraction of you know all the way up to blueprints, right? It's, that's kind of far up the chain in terms. Um, as far as abstractions go, uh, always good to know a little bit of what's actually going on behind the scenes. Yeah, and, and a lot of it comes down to, again, um, the, the logic that you're building and, and having it work with the logic that you're building. And, and there's not always necessarily one right way to do it. Um, you know, if, if you're making a, you know, a mobile game, uh, you know, a Space Invaders game that's only going to have, um, you know, uh, 32 actors mm -hmm. uh, variants at, at any one time, then you may never need to worry about this at all. Um, but having the knowledge base uh, and knowing uh, the, the general way that it works, again, can save you down the line uh, if when you decide to, to add those things. Um, and, you know, I've never, uh, I, I don't think I've ever had a case where I thought, man, I, I wish I hadn't spent that extra couple hours in the beginning uh, researching this and under, and learning about it and setting it up in a good way, um, you know. Gosh, I wish that I had that two hours back. I have had a lot of times where, oh gosh, I have to go back and change this, and I, you know, I went in a direction that was uh, in incredibly challenging, and now I have to spend days uh, working on this. Um, but again, um, you know, there's there's not necessarily one right way to do everything. There's, there's and and that's what makes it challenging. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what makes game development hard. Is there's a lot of different ways, a lot of times, to accomplish the same goal. Leads us into another question I saw here. Um, is there a good use case not to use soft references wherever <laughs> you can? And I think you touched on it a little bit with sort of the, the small scale example of the Space Invaders project. Yeah, but also, um, and, uh, you know, it was funny because just yesterday, uh, I, I think my tutorial might have made some impact because it was funny because yesterday I was in at uh, the Facebook Unreal Help Desk and I, I, I go through that kind of every couple of days and just see if there's questions I can quickly answer. And someone was asking a general question about uh, building, using construction script to, to build a, a roadside generator. And, and someone's first response was, make sure you use soft object references, don't have all these references in there. It's, and I'm like, well, that's, you know, that's a beginner having a beginning question, trying to set up a, basically learn the fundamentals of construction script. Mm -hmm. um, it, you, um, it, it, it can, it does add complication to your blueprints. And it, it you know, if, if every single time you create any variable, you're creating a soft object reference, and then you're asynchronously loading that, and then you're, you're going through there, that's a, that's a, a, a lot of complication. Um, that's going to increase the actual load times on your blueprints when you open them up in the editor. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why you, you generally try to compress things and, and have things to be simpler. Uh, it's going to add complication to the logic when you're debugging things. Um, and it can get quite complicated quite quickly. Um, so, you know, it, it, again, it's, you know, if, if you know that if, if you know that this is going to be referenced and it's going to be used, um, there's not generally a uh, you know say for example if if I was in uh, making Super Mario Brothers the first level, um, I wouldn't go and set each of those enemies as a uh, soft object reference and then try to. Uh, you know, right before he runs into a mushroom, uh, go, okay, well, now I need to load the mushroom into memory. And uh, later, okay, here's the turtle two minutes later. Now I'm going to load the turtle into memory. I would probably just add all those enemies into the level, have them loaded into memory and not worry about it because I, you know, I know there's only going to be 10 of them. Um, it, I budgeted for that. Um, you, you don't want to get too caught up into like trying to constantly go, okay, well, there's no more mushrooms now. Like, like okay, you know, let's get that out of the way. Um, so uh, I, I guess, you know, that's that's thinking about, you know, where am I going to go? So if your budget um, take into account that, hey, you know, we're budgeted for 20 enemies per level. We're good to go. We've got bandwidth there. We're never going to, you know, we're, we're, we know that as long as we stay below that, we're 100 percent good. Then, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. Um, uh, when it comes to those enemies, you can just have them all loaded up on load time. Your 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 front loading front loading uh, that time onto the player uh, to make sure that everything's in memory and that way everything's instantaneous as you're rolling through because everything's loaded into memory. So we had a specific question. Um, so if you're doing an actor spawner, would you place the spawner in the level or have a soft reference to spawn the spawner, then soft references to spawn the assets as well? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would... So assuming that your spawner is uh, is relatively lightweight, um, I would place the, the spawner in the level. I mean, that's the whole point of having a spawner is that yeah. it's lightweight compared to what it's spawning. Um, however, the thing to think about, if that spawner actor, um, and I actually have another, I did a talk um, a couple of weeks ago at Vector where I did a really rapid prototype on an arcade style game that I built like super simple spawners. Um, and I, I actually have a video of that that I'll probably put out. in the Yeah, next let's put that in the uh, forum announcement post on the resources. Yeah. Um, so I, I put spawners in there, even though they were basically just empty actors that spawn another actor with the with the idea that later I would you know have more actors. So if your spawner has uh, say you want to randomize uh, enemy spawner, and so you have a blueprint and it basically says, hey, when I'm activated, you know, spawn an actor of this class. And then you have 10 different classes as variables in that spawner. All 10 of those are going to be loaded into memory. Um, and that's that might be fine. But in that case, if you only want to have um, the spawner uh, load the actor that's actually going to be spawned into memory. Uh, again, going back to Super Mario Brothers is the an example. Um, what you could do is, you know, I hit level two, I know the types of enemies that are going to be spawned in, um, and either I might have a special spawner that, uh, that only contains those actor references, or in that spawner, I could say, uh, okay, spawners in the level, here's the type of actors that you could have, go into your soft references, load those specific actors into memory, that way your spawner's ready to go, has those loaded on begin play, um, only load those and then spawn from those specific classes. Does, does that make sense yeah. as an example? I think so, I think so. And uh, we had a few more questions sort of related to, uh, let's see here, um, that I think relates a little bit. How would one go about using soft references for assets referenced in data tables? You know, data tables get, get, get brought up a lot in reference to this. And I, I have to apologize because I'm not super uh, familiar with data tables. I don't actually use them a lot. Um, so yeah, so I would, I would have to pass on that one that we, I, I'd want to do a little bit of follow-up on how specifically to reference those assets from data to tables uh, as variables. Unless you know, Victor. No, I, I, I don't actually. <laughs> I, I was going to mention that, you know, some of the first games I, I shipped, they not a single soft object reference at all. Yes. Just yeah. entirely in blueprints, just hard references to everything. And um, 
And, and, and again, data tables are something, you know, data tables to me are a little old school. Um, and I, I try to stay away from them personally, just because I've had so many, anytime something gets into spreadsheet form and, 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 and manual text entry form, I get scared uh, when it comes to QA. I've had, you know, if, if any designers dealt with localization tables in the past, um, they, I'm sure they had terrible horror stories about um, trying to track down bugs and things like that in there. So I, I like to minimize data entry uh, by game designers because I know how ADD we are and how we have a tendency to screw things up in very little ways. Um, uh, so I, I like to have stuff uh, in my blueprints uh, so that I can um, make sure that they're, um, they're, they're actually referencing an object and not using a text string to, to, uh, to reference objects. And that's a so, personal thing though. Right. I was going to say that. And, and as always, it is important to sometimes consider your personal preferences over the pos possibility of a very, very, very vi minor optimization, right? You need to remember yes. that we are all humans that need to work with these projects. And if you try to do the, the best, best, best practice every single time, everywhere, the amount of time you'll spend on that, the amount of complexity you might add to this for you as a human to actually work with this, um, you know, the, the production part of the game is sometimes as important, especially if you have, you know, a, a budget limitation or a time limitation. Sometimes, and as always, there's a thousand ways to do everything, um, but sometimes take your personal preference into the, the, the sort of plan for development as well there. And that can be important. As always, you know, balance that versus the performance optimization and uh, try to learn as much as possible about that so that you can make a qualified decision um, whether this is the right choice or not. Should it go personal? Should it go best practice uh, in terms of, you know, optimization? And, and think about, um, you know, uh, the, the effect on, uh, you know, things like test as well. Um, you know, I, I actually uh, shot myself in the foot a little bit trying to do an optimization on Parachess, where uh, right now I'm working on uh, like some of the, the king threat logic to stop the king from being able to move to places where... Um, where they're not supposed to be able to move, they're threatened by another piece. And I was running uh, a check on uh, the entire board to check every piece, uh, every mm -hmm. tile. Um, so that was sixty, you know, sixty-four checks every tick. And I said, well, it'd be much more efficient to only check from the the, the pieces that are actually occupied by the enemy because that would only be you know maximum sixteen. So that's sixty-four versus sixteen checks per tick. That's going to be more efficient. I should do that. Meanwhile, in trying to do that, I blew up my logic um, and, and essentially broke the game uh, because the logic really was built around checking every tile. And then so I, then I kind of went down this rabbit hole where then I had to go back and compensate for that. And I'm adding much more logic to, to double check it. it I'm like, but I, I don't think that in the end, I ended up with necessarily a more optimized project because yes, I was only doing 16 checks here instead of 64 checks here, but then I had to add a bunch more check logic to, to compensate for that. And it probably would have just been better, uh, especially because I wasn't actually seeing a performance hit on it. I just, my game designer brain went, this will be more efficient. Yeah. Um, and so that that's a, can be a natural thing, especially with programmers and game designers, um, where you can you can cross over that threshold of adding inefficiency uh, while trying to do optimization. Let's see, we have a little bit more time. Um, let's see if we got some new questions in. Um, um, I think this is a good one. What's a one sentence summary of why soft object references are used? <clears throat> Wow. <laughs> now, okay. now we have to put the wordsmith hats on. <laughs> Soft object references are used to put the control of when the object is loaded into memory into the designer's hands. I think that works. Boom. Um, there's a question. Do we need to unload the assets that we're not going to use anymore? And I think uh, I'd follow up. And I think I'd follow up with how would you how would you specifically do that? Yeah, that, that tags into something I mentioned in the beginning. Generally, um, there so there is no manual uh, in Blueprint. There's no manual like uh, async unload this object. Mm -hmm. um, that's because in general case, uh, your garbage collection is going to handle that. 
so uh, if once you load it into memory um, uh, manually through asynchronous loading, um, if it gets to a certain point where the object is no longer needed in memory, where it's not referenced by anything, it's been destroyed, um, you know, nothing else is referencing it, the garbage collection uh, system is going to uh, unload that at a certain point. Point. Uh, again, that could be on a uh, new level load, you know, whenever garbage collection runs. Uh, so in general, uh, the system should take care of that automatically. There are ways in uh, uh, to create specific functions for that in C++. Um, I think uh, Alex Stevens uh, recently did a, a tweet storm on that uh, recently. Um, uh, but that information is there uh, if, if you need to get into the, the really fine detail. Um, but in general, your, your garbage collection is going to handle it, you know, exactly the same as it would for a destroyed actor um, that, that, you know, you spawn in uh, and is, is not referenced. And, and there's an, that's another portion of sort of memory management, say, for an example, if you have an automatic weapon of some sort that is firing, you know, X bullets a second, if you never destroy those projectiles, you're quickly going to run out of memory, right? And if, if they're all being somewhere drawn, maybe they're sitting on a wall or something, um, you're going to run into other issues. But if you do have sort of a max lifespan, uh, which is a way that I like to, you know, not have to worry about manually calling, you know, destroy, um, to just to make sure that, hey, after 30 seconds, like this projectile has traveled five times the length of the size of my map. There is no way that this actor is being used in any way, shape or form. Um, I'll add a, you know, a 30 second um, uh, data to the lifespan variable that, that exists in every actor. Uh, and so making sure that you, you sort of destroy them. And then once you've destroyed that actor, garbage collection will come in uh, and remove all of that from memory. And so that initial step could be all you need to sort of think about and then manage what um, garbage collection is actually being done. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, lifespan uh, of various different objects. Um, yeah, you, you, and again, um, you know, multiple versions of the same, you know, uh, uh, instances of, of the same actor, you know, obviously it's, it, it's not a, a linear scale on memory usage. Um, and um, yeah, so just just building in smart things, you know, especially again, a lot of it, a lot of this comes into account when you have, you know, um, an object that, you know, references, uh, references something that references something else that references mm -hmm. something else, you know, it, we've all we've all built, I, I think the first thing most game designers do is build an actor that spawns another actor that spawns another actor and then go, oh, that was not a good idea. Um, uh, now I have, you know, infinite number. And, and most of the time the engine will try to stop you like, stop, you're doing an infinite loop, stop it. Um, but, um, you know, once, once you start creating things that create other things, um, you know, you, that, that can help you visualize what it can do to memory management. You know, if you have an actor that's randomly, you know, uh, spawning an actor that has another reference to another hundred actors in it, um, you can very quickly get into the millions and billions of uh, things loaded into memory. Or your game just crashes. There's a lot to think about in game development. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is a good question. Let's see if we can. <clears throat> Excuse me, if we can tackle this. If one were to stay away from data tables, uh, I'm sorry, bringing data tables up again, but uh, it, it's a good point, and they're very, they can be very useful. Uh, if one were to stay away from data tables, what's the best way to manage thousands of objects for a character customizer, and you need to group specific objects by category? Hats, pants. Uh, I would think the interfaces would be a good way to do this. Um, you can also do them in functions. Um, you know, you can have your, uh, you can utilize the your functions for your organization of uh, your um, of, of your hierarchy. Um, it, it's really at that point, it's you know, outside of data management tables, it's it's you know, layering the things in. You know, having a uh, you know a class of pants. Um, that has all your information for their various different pants, um, either as an interface or a function uh, where you're going to access that data. It, it, it's really about, at that point, it, it, it becomes, it goes into how you want to organize and manage that information. Um, uh, so, you know, you can, you know, set up your variables how you want. You can organize them in, into, uh, into different uh, categories. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, just build that to access the information. 
uh, does I don't know if that answered the question. I think there's a balance there as well. If you know you have thousands of actors, you know, might be good to actually do a data table in terms of management. You might even have an, you know, if that's the case that you say you have, RPG is a good example, right? Because there's usually a lot of different pieces of equipment, skills, you name it, what it could yeah. be. Um, at some point, it does get easier to manage all of that. You, you know, you might even have a complete dedicated like QA person just dedicated to, you know, making sure that all of these um all of the names in the data table are correct, you know, and at yep. that point, it, it's easier for that person to actually manage uh, CSV files other than having to go in and open every blueprint and possibly check them out, prevent the designer from being able to work on them. Um, yep. And so there, there's... Yeah, I, and that where it get, that's that's where you start getting into good source control management, right? Like um, the what, one of the stories uh, from my uh, related to this that, that came up was... Um, uh, it was in a different engine, but they were using a you know data table type information, and um, they were actually getting ready for gold. And the when they were building the final version of the game, at a certain point, the person that was managing one of the data tables did a check in, changed some of the data tables, and so half of the information was current and half the information wasn't current because the source uh, control didn't differentiate. Uh, you know, uh, when it was checked in. Um, so yeah, you know, you start getting into your source control. How do you want to manage that information? Uh, what works best for your team? You know, how many people you have, whether those people are on site or remote, um, all those kinds of things start to come into play. Um, it really, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I mentioned localization earlier, you know, when you start managing loc, um, if you, if you think that RPG item management is complicated, you know, managing loc for multiple different languages, you know, for 10,000 lines of dialogue. Um, that, that can be a good thing. Any game designer should go read up on, on managing the localization because uh, it's a, there's a lot of great information on there, how to manage a lot of data and especially a lot of data that you don't necessarily know what it is, right? right. Like if you're managing localization in German, you might not actually be able to just inherently look at it and go like, oh yeah, that's right. Um, so you need to set up systems within your, uh, within your team to make sure that you understand whether it's tags or how you do it, how you organize that information. Um, and that can apply into, into game systems as well. We did have Paulo Souza on the uh, live stream uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about localization. So if you're curious about that, and um, he, he do mention briefly sort of how to deal with um, contractors that, because essentially you're not going to have, well, you probably won't have 12 people on your team that all speak different languages and know specifically how everything is spelled and the correct grammar and ways to change, you know, um, whether they're puns or, or possibly sayings in one language and how to translate them, you are going to have to use a, a, a contractor to, um, to manage all of that. And we did do a stream where Paulo goes through how to do that in Unreal Engine and what the tool, which tools exist for you um, to, to help with that. Um, uh, a good question about garbage collection that I think we can tackle. Uh, following the projectile life, the projectile lifespan uh, that we talked about, is gar is the garbage collector run for every bullet destroyed, or will it batch them? Um, I believe. I mean, it, it. So the garbage collection doesn't constantly run. Garbage collection, you know, gets to a certain point, and, and again, you can control some of that. Um, so it's going to go through, and as I understand it, it's going to go through and essentially say, "Hey, here's all the objects right now that I can get rid of." Uh, and it's essentially basically, you know, so if you had 50 different types of projectiles uh, coming out of your weapon and they all lifespan expired, basically the next time the garbage collection came through, it would say, okay, all of these are ready to go. Boom, dump them all at once. Yeah, That's well, how I understand it. Yeah, when you do call the destroy actor note, it actually gets put, puts in a, in a list and, uh, and when the garbage collector does its collector, does its tick, it will actually go and nuke everything that's in that list. Exactly. Um, there are a few questions about sort of network relevancy and how you deal with soft object references um, when it relates to that. I'm not too familiar with that myself. Uh, not sure if you've had a chance to tackle that yet. Um, not really, no. Um, it, you know, once the variable, once the object is loaded into memory, you're, 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 as I understand it, you're, you're going to do your uh, relevancy the same as you would anything else. Um, but you, I, I would want to do, if you're working in a multiplayer environment, I'd, I want to do a little bit more research. That's maybe something I can follow up on is whether I need to treat those objects a little bit differently on, you know, making sure whether they're loaded on clients and, uh, and servers as well. 
Yeah, there could be some form of prediction there that um, you might want to implement based on that. Um, so you can set the tick rate for the garbage collector to fire off. Yes, I believe that's in project settings. Yeah, I think so. Um, and you can, you can manually force garbage collection as well. Yes. Um, there's a question about if we can give any prominent examples from any well-known games, uh, if they were using Unreal Engine, of when soft object references should be used. I think we tackled a couple of those use cases in, in general. Um, I have no specific information about whether game A or game B used um, that particular method. No, I don't, not, not offhand. All right, well. Uh, this has been a really, really good and informational stream. I appreciate you coming on and doing the presentation. And for everyone, if you're, um, if you're curious and you want to share sort of a, a, a quick version of this, uh, Christian did uh, pre present a or upload a video, which is it's like 10, 10 minutes long. Ten minutes, like yeah. Yeah, uh, on Vimeo, and I've gone ahead and linked it in the forum announcement post already. Um, so if you're curious and you want sort of the, this stream, but in a quick format and something you can share to someone who's like, what soft object references? You can send that video. And then if they're like, I would like to work on this, you can go ahead and link them to the live stream, which by the way, I did see a question that usually comes up. Uh, all of our live streams get uploaded to YouTube uh, once they, uh, once we're finished, once Twitch is done processing and then YouTube's done processing, uh, they will exist there. And uh, usually every weekend we, we tweet a link to that as well. And you can find it archived. So if you're going through our, um, our forums in the event section of the forum where we post all of the announcements for the live streams. Whenever the stream is done and it's up on YouTube, we go ahead and we add that link to the live stream. And so if you see a topic that's been, um, that we've already done live and you would like to check it out, the embedded version of the YouTube video should be there in the forum announcement post. Um, I think with that, I think it's time to wrap up uh, for today. Like I said, it's, it's, it's been great. Uh, next week, we're going to have Wife Johnson on talking about Niagara and 425. So, um, yeah, it's going to be going to be cool. Uh, he's sort of our, uh, our Niagara wizard here on the team, <laughs> awesome. making all kinds of exciting things. Um, yeah, once again, thanks, Christian, for coming on. Um, I do want to mention for all of you who actually stream Unreal Engine development on Twitch that there is now a new tag, and you can see it uh, as part of this stream, actually. You can now tag your stream uh, with Unreal Engine. Uh, which, which is kind of cool. So that means that you can stream in whichever category that you feel entails most to you, whether you're doing art or you want to be in science and technology or just creative, uh, you can go ahead and add the Unreal Engine tag to make sure that if someone just search for Unreal Engine, they'll be able to find all the current live streams and streamers that are using the tag, uh, which is a pretty neat little, neat little thing for them. So thanks, Twitch. Um, as always, we are still looking for more countdown videos. If you saw, if you've been here from the beginning of the stream, we appreciate you watching and staying with us for this long. Uh, if you saw that little countdown video, it is 30 minutes of development that, do, that you record and then speed that up to five minutes. Send that to uh, community at unrealengine.com and we will put the little countdown. Don't composite or add anything to the video itself. Uh, send that with your logo and we'll add a little countdown to it. Um, add some nice little uh, intro music track and you might be one of the uh, people that we showcase at the beginning of the stream. Um, make sure you follow us on social media for all news related to whether it's Unreal 4 or Unreal Engine 5, um, which you can see. Uh, also, I should mention that uh, Christian's virtual background is actually available if you would like to use that in Zoom, uh, which is kind of fancy. Uh, I, I like it a lot. I think you did, did a good choice. Um, yeah, I like it. Yeah, it's almost like Stargate. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, I, I think I think that's it for this week. I appreciate everyone for coming on. Everyone in chat, say goodbye to Christian, and uh, I hope to see you once at some point. Oh, I'll make sure to add the uh, link to the stream that you did on Parachess if anyone is interested in watching that as well. Little project Christian's been working on that I think is pretty cool. Awesome! Thanks very much. Uh, happy. Thanks for being having me on, and uh, yeah, see you online. Yeah, we'll see you all online. Have a good rest of your week, everyone. Bye.